You've worked alongside Rob for six years. What do you make of the appointment and, well, what will he bring to the role? Uh, it's not a surprise. It was obviously highly touted in the last few days that he was going to take over. I think everybody knew it was coming. It's just when it was going to be announced and they've announced it today. So I uh, wish him well, first of all, as a former colleague and a, and a friend, I wish him well. Um, his instincts on cricket are very sound. He's got good cricket knowledge. What he doesn't have is managerial experience, uh, which he'll obviously um, have to get up to speed in uh, on in the, in the new job. Um, and he's got a lot on his plate. There's a lot of uh, appointments to be filled. You know, the new, he'll need a new test captain, a New England coach, probably a New England selector. So there's a, a, a lot on his plate. How much pressure will he be under to get those uh, decisions right? Well, I think that is the job, really, um, getting the big decisions right. And if you get the big decisions right, then the rest almost takes care of itself. Although it will be a full-on job and he'll have a lot of work to do, I think it's those key appointments that need to be right. And that's the area that Giles fell down on, really. You know, he appointed Chris Silverwood, he loaded all the selection to Chris Silverwood and it didn't work. Uh, and that cost him in the end. So if Rob gets the key decisions right and they're not straightforward, I mean, there are very few alternatives to Joe Root as England captain. I would have thought his first job is to scoot up the M20 and uh, go and see Ben Stokes up north and see how he is. Uh, and then turn his attentions to the coach, having listened to his punditry over the last few years, like many of us, he feels that the job should be split between limited overs and, and test match cricket. He'll, he'll want probably split coaches there and then bring back a national selector. So um, those are the key appointments, really. And if he gets them right, then the rest almost takes care of itself. Uh, NASA talked earlier about his knowledge and his experience, his enthusiasm for the game. How key do you think those attributes are going to be in this new role? Well, I don't think it, you can do the job without knowledge of cricket. It is a, a cricket-based job. You're making a lot of decisions that are around the minutiae of the game. So you need to know the game. And obviously, he played at, at Kent for many years. He was there for well, a, lot, a, a long, long time, 1996 to 2015, I think his career was. So it's a long first-class career that he's had. He obviously had a fair amount of international experience as well. He was a, a damn good player. You don't score a double hundred in test match cricket without being a good player. So he's got a, a lot of kind of knowledge and experience in that sense about the game. I think his instincts are very sound. Uh, what he doesn't have is the kind of managerial experience, if you like. This is a, a managerial type job and he doesn't have that experience because he, he, he went into commentary and punditry after after his career finished, so he will pick up that experience. I mean, that lack of experience didn't hinder Andrew Strauss in the past, uh, and it didn't inoculate Ashley Giles from the difficulties. Giles had a lot of management experience with Warwickshire and Lancashire and had done a, an academic degree in sporting directorship. So there's no guarantee whether you've got the experience or not, whether you're going to make a success of the job. You never quite know. Uh, what about um, the situation with um, James Anderson and Stuart Broad? Where do you think he will stand uh, on those two players? Well, in the last uh, podcast that we did, he was pretty supportive of James Anderson and Stuart Broad. You pundit to what he said a few months ago. I'm not quite so sure, but he was uh, he, he backed Andrew Strauss's decision uh, in that sense. It maybe has a different perspective on things now. Um, we'll have to wait and see. Um, there, perhaps that's a less important decision than captain, first of all, then coach, then selector. I would say those are the three key decisions. Uh, and then you, you're talking about selecting the first team for the test match, which comes along on about June the 8th, I think, England's first test match is. So there's a bit of time uh, before then to sort out the f first 11. But it's a broader job than that. Um, it's both Test Match team and Limited Overs team, but equally running simultaneous to that is Andrew Strauss's high performance review, which Rob Key will now sit on. And then there's a lot of chat about the structure and scheduling of the domestic game. So those are areas, broader areas that he'll have some influence on as well. Uh, NASA told us that one challenge uh, will be that Key's very popular with the players and now he's got to be able to say no to them. Do you see that as being a problem for him? 
Well, I, I don't know how much he's going to be in the dressing room. If I was in that role, I wouldn't be in the dressing room very much, if truth be told. I think you make the key appointments, captain, coaches, and then you let them get on with the job. So how much day-to-day -day involvement he'll have with the players, I don't know. I mean, clearly, as a, 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 there's a number of centrally contracted players there for whom he is the ultimate boss, and he has to make decisions on the nature of those contracts. He may have to make decisions on whether players go to IPL or other franchise leagues. So he will have to make decisions that are unpopular from time to time. But that is the nature of the job. And just because he's a... Uh, an easygoing guy with a, a good manner about him, I don't think will prevent him from making difficult decisions. I think the fact that he's got a good manner actually is quite, is quite important. It's, it's a bit more important than people might think because the ECB is a pretty unpopular organisation at the moment. It's got a very corporate face to it. It's kind of outward face is very corporate. And Rob will bring a, a slightly more human uh, face to that organisation, which is no bad thing. So if we were to speak in 12 months' time, Michael, what would be your expectations to view those as a successful first year in Rob Key's era? Well, about six weeks ago, Tom Harrison described the, the men's cricket department as being not fit for purpose. They're pretty strong words. Um, so he's got to get that department up to speed and fit for purpose. And if you look at the sequencing of the jobs that he has to appoint, he's got to get get those in place and get those right. I think it would be too much to expect just the test team to be turned around immediately. But there are some easy fixes there. The other thing I would say is the sequencing of, of Rob's appointment is odd as well, because the ECB doesn't have a chairman and the, the chief executive is not expected to be there for too much longer. So you'd kind of expect the sequencing to be top down maybe, um, you know, put the chairman in first, then the chief executive and then the managing director. So um, that is a little odd. So there's kind of lots of things up in the air is what I'm trying to say with the ECB at the moment. Um, and clearly this is one piece of the jigsaw that has been put in place, but there are many others to be filled yet.